Say it with me. Blessed am I. Blessed am I. Because my eyes do see. Because my eyes do see. And my ears do hear. And my ears do hear. I anticipate. I anticipate. God's revelation in my life. God's revelation in my life. Amen. Amen. Now we are still talking about the king and the kingdom. And uh, all that that has meant throughout time. God has always had the purpose in his heart to rule and to reign. Um, and, of course, that fits hand in glove with what we also understand about the creation and uh, the angels and the reasons why God did what he did. Uh, I think that maybe if you remember some of that, you, you will have to understand why a kingdom and why it is, um, why voluntary, willing um, submission to God and exalting him as king over a kingdom is necessary in that um, in that storyline and uh, to represent the purpose of this creation. Remember, with the loose for rebelling against God, it was essentially a a, a, re a rebelling against God's authority and saying, you know, essentially, who are you? Why should why is it just because you're the one that made me? Well, what if I had been bored, God? You know, what well, what if I had just always been and I'm the one that made you? Why is it that I have got to be the one serving you? What makes you better than me? I'm going to exalt my throne above the heavens. I will make myself like the most high. That was the 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 what was in the heart of Lucifer, right? Yes. And so, you know, it was important that through this creation God established not only a king and a kingdom, but that it be a willing a one that in which free will people willingly participate. Recognizing and understanding all other options, they see that as being the right thing. Do you see what I'm saying? And it winds up illustrating through our testimony the, 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 the rightness, if you will, of God's claim to God. God's claim to rule. God's claim to reign. And so God has always from the beginning been seeking to rule and reign in and through his people. That has never changed. It's taken on many different forms, many different facets, but it is the same thing is it's always it's the same goal that he's always had now we left off last uh, um, I guess on Sunday on in the book of Revelation we're going to start there but we're not going to read too far before we go someplace else um, starting in chapter 20 remember at the end of chapter 19 it was very exciting because you have the marriage of the Lamb, right? Yes. And then you have Jesus coming down on a white horse, and all of us are given horses to ride on, and we come down to make war with the prophet and with the beast, yes. and to and all those who side with him, and uh, and literally utterly destroy them, and then Jesus establishes his kingdom here on the earth, and a, an angel lays hold on Lucifer, and binds him and casts him into the bottomless pit. So let's read that in um, Revelation chapter 20, reading verse from 1 through verse 3. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven with the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Then he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, closed it, put a seal on it so that um, so that he would no longer deceive the nations until the 1,000 years were complete. After that, he must be. Everybody say, must be. Must See, there's a story going on, isn't there? Yeah. There's an objective, isn't there? Yeah. Are you going to understand all of it immediately? No, but when God uses the word must, he means it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, God says he must be released for a short time. Because otherwise, it wouldn't be a just judgment that's coming. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, now, and in fact, during that thousand-year reign time period is going to be the most unique in human history. It will be the first time where man will not be influenced by Satan. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, it won't make a difference. Yeah, no. <laughs> man will still be abundantly wicked. Yeah. Mm. It won't make a difference. And that's part of the accusation. So, um, you know, the, the devil will be locked up for a thousand years. And the whole reason was so that he cannot deceive the nations by, um, uh, and, and essentially by influencing them. That's what he does. To deceive the nations no more for a thousand years. And during that time people, period, 
everybody will wind up serving the Lord. Some of them out of a heart of, of a voluntary heart that loves and worship him and others because he's ruling with a rod of iron and they have no choice. And the first chance they get when Lucifer is re released from the abyss, they will rebel against him and not war against Jesus Christ and against the city, right? And now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let's go ahead and look at a few things real quickly. Um, what influence does Satan have over the world and the kingdoms of this world today? Turn to Ephesians, the second chapter. So we want to know what they, what's going to be stopped. We need to know what is he doing, right? Well, that, that made a lot of sense to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> if we want to find out what it is that's going to stop, we need to know what he's doing. So uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, reading through verse 9, it says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins. This is talking about the church of Ephesus. In which you, in which you previously walked according to the worldly age, this worldly age, according to the ruler of, the, of this atmospheric domain, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So he's saying here that back when we were not born again, we were underneath the jurisdiction of Lucifer. And we did what he wanted us to do. Do you see that in those verses? Let's keep on reading. It says, We too all previously lived among, the, among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and by nature were children under wrath, just as others also. But God, who is abundant in mercy because of his great love that he, lo that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. By grace you have been saved. Now, I want you, it's, it's missed on a Gentile reader, but it shouldn't be missed on you. What was happening back when we were in the world was we were being influenced by our Lord, Lucifer. It was an evil type of grace. Right? Yeah. He didn't create anything new. He, you realize the devil can't even make a non-believer do something that they don't want to do. Isn't that true? Amen. He can't make them do it. He can't make you do it. Right? In the same way that God doesn't make the non-regenerate do something more than he makes you do it. True? God always does things by influence. And the enemy is restricted by the same boundaries. It's grace. The word grace just means influence. You could stick the word evil and good in front of it to qualify what kind, but it's still grace. Are you understanding? Yeah. I understand that the, 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 the religious world, most of the Christian world would have no bad to put that statement in. But the devil has grace. Tons of it. He's influencing people all the time. Isn't he? Yes. It's, it's happening all around us. Isn't it right? And it's free. Doesn't cost you anything to be influenced, does it? No. no uh, now, now if, you, if you walk in the light of it, it'll cost you everything. Yes. But that's true of God. Won't it? Yes. But one's going to lead to death and the other's going to lead to life. That's a big difference, isn't it? Right? It says, uh, but to all, but uh, listen, starting verse 4. But God, who is abundant in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dread in trespasses, by grace you are saved. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, well, where is Christ sitting? Right the Father's right hand. In fact, uh, and, and again, some of these words are metaphorical, because if you read it in another place, which I'm certain we will not see tonight, but if we were to get to that place tonight, you'll find that to those that overcome, the prom, one of the promises is that we will sit with Jesus Christ on his throne, even as Jesus sat with God the Father on his throne. So it almost leaves the picture of all three of us sitting on the same throne, together. <laughs> And in other words, it's really more of a metaphor. We're all reigning with him, in other words. It's not like we're actually all X number of hundred million of us all crowded up on one big chair. Okay, it's, it's, it's metaphorical. You do understand that, right? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's talking about ruling and reigning with him. I'm sure that if you really want to get up on the throne, I'm sure he will let you. You know, if you want to climb up in his lap, I doubt that he would say no to a son or a daughter. But that's really not what he's getting at, you know? In fact, it says right here that we're already there, at least in a sense. Isn't it true? Yeah. Right? So he says here, He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, 
Meaning the one that we're in right now is not the only age. Right, right now we're in the age of the Gentiles. Gentiles. Oh, you guys are so good. The time of the Gentiles, right? But this isn't the only one, is it? There's more to come, isn't there? Right? He says, so in the ages to come, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For an eternity, during this dispensation, and in those that are coming, God is going to be kind to us. Yay. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> if there's anybody that knows how to be kind well, it would be God, you think? You know what I mean? I think he can do it and do it with style. Acts in his acts of kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself, it is God's gift to you. Not of works, so that none of us can wind up boasting in the end. Amen. Amen. It's all going to be the king. Yeah. It's not going to be you. It's not going to be me. Acts 26, 18. Acts 26, 18. I'm just starting there. There's obviously more. It's starting off with the word two. It says, to open their eyes in order to turn them from, uh, turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So we have been turned from the power of Satan. So again, why are we looking at this right now? We're looking at what is it that when the enemy has been locked up for a thousand years, what's stopping? Well, one of the things is his work in the sons of disobedience. He can't work in them anymore. He's not around them to influence them, right? Um, the, their, um, their ungodly acts, they're, they're living according to their lusts. He can't influence them towards that anymore. And also, in a sense, they're being delivered from the authority of darkness because the one with the authority is locked up for a thousand years. It doesn't do a whole lot. How many people realize that when the teacher is away, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. The now, does anybody question that the teacher has authority? No. Well, in today's world you do. But back in the day, teachers had real authority, right? You know, when they walked in the room, you shut up. Isn't that right? Yeah. But, you know, when they went out in the hall, it wasn't usually too long before there was a little jibber-jabbering going on, right? Because the authority isn't present. That doesn't mean the authority doesn't exist. It's just not there to enforce it. Right? Lucifer will be gone for a thousand years. Doesn't mean authority's not there in the kingdom of darkness. And if you're not born again, you're not under the sway of that authority. But there's no one there to enforce it. Is somebody with me? You're getting a picture of what this day is going to be like. All right? I'm going to give you an example. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. And again, I'm cherry-picking verses. I'm hoping you're writing them down so you can read them in context later. But for sake of time, I'm not reading the whole context. Okay? But 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. It says, deliver such a one, this is talking about a person who's caught in sin and is unrepentant, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that their spirit may be saved in the day of judgment. Destruction of their flesh is something that the devil does, isn't it? Yeah. And what it says here, it says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Well, the word destruction of the flesh, it doesn't mean the annihilation of the flesh in any way. What it means is, the fundamental thought is one of um, unavoidable distress and torment. Unavoidable distress and torment. That's what the devil does. Well, he's going to be locked up for a thousand years. So it's probably going to be a little bit more avoidable. Distress and torment. Are you following? Yeah. Okay. Well, what else does he do? Well, he steals the word from our heart. Turn to Mark chapter 4, verse 15. It's one you guys should be very familiar with. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan comes when? Immediately. Immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. He won't be able to do that anymore. He's locked up for a thousand years. Are well, you guys beginning to get a picture? Yeah. Mark 4, 15. You can find it also in Matthew and also in Luke. Yeah. He does this, what he does by stealing the word of God from your heart, he does it by deceit. By, uh, and he deceives you about what God's intentions are, like he did with Eve. Or the purposes of God. Or that he calls in to question the trustworthiness of God. And uh, he also gives man a bloated sense of self-importance. Isn't that right? 
That's how he deceives us. You guys following that? Have, have you experienced all of those? I have. Amen? Isn't it true? Every single one of them. Deceive you about the intentions of God, the purposes of God, the trustworthiness of God, and gives you a bloated idea of your own personal importance. He loves to do that. That's right up his alley, isn't it? It started with the very rebellion from heaven, correct? Also, the next thing is that he leads us into destruction. Luke 22, verse 3. Luke 22, verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. What was the end result of this? Destruction, destruction wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Not only physical, but ultimately spiritually, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Satan entered him, and it wound up being his destruction. You notice also that the enemy will influence you to do something, and then after you do it, condemn you for having done it. That's right? Because right? mm -hmm. that's his thing. That's his game. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just yeah. how he rolls. Next one is to entice us to lie against, uh, our, uh, against God, ourselves, and others. He entices us to lie against God, ourselves, and others. That's in found an example of which is found in Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie against the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the, the price of the land for yourselves? Who filled his heart to lie against the Holy Spirit? Satan, Satan did. He also tempts us, isn't that right? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. This is talking about married couples. It says that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He tempts us, doesn't he? Yes? He's also constantly looking to take advantage of us. Is he sounding more and more nasty by the minute? Yeah. He is a nasty you-know-what. So I'm constantly looking to take advantage of us. Look at um, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Now, whomever you forgive anything, Paul says, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his methods. Paul wasn't aware of what was being forgiven over there in Ephesus or who the parties were involved that were involved. But he said, you know what? If you've forgiven them, by extension, I enter into that same forgiveness, lest the enemy take us by advantage and take advantage of us, right? Because we're not ignorant of his methods. That would be a great opportunity to bring in division, wouldn't it? Yes. Wouldn't it? Also, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. Go ahead and say that with me. I am a servant of the Lord. I am a servant of the Lord. Unless you, make, unless you make the mistake of thinking this is just for ministers. He says, and the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. If God will perhaps grant them a change of heart so that they might know the truth and they might come to their senses and escape the snare or the trap of the devil, having been take cap taken captive by him to do his will. What was that, what was that reference again? That was in 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 oh, through 20. Peter. What? You said, said Peter. Peter? Yeah. Peter? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's because Peter's right after that, probably. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, chapter 24, uh, verse 24 through 26. So let me read it again. And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them a change of heart, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses, and escape the snare of the devil, or the trap of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. He's constantly looking to take advantage, isn't he? And it started with, don't quarrel. You're laying yourself open. Right? He will take advantage of you. Right? What are the things that he wound up doing? God would, not, God would wind up having to give them the ability to change their mind because the enemy is working to harden your heart. Mm -hmm. Right? It says, so that they might know the truth. What did he do? He blinded their eyes from the truth. 
right? Yes. Also, that they might come to their senses. You know, if you're following the devil, you've lost your senses. Yeah. True? Yes. I mean, that's funny. And it's also true. Yeah. You know, in a non-funny sense. <laughs> right? <coughs> Having been taken captive by him to do his will. God, what a horrible state. Yeah. Yes. First Peter, I mean it this time, <laughs> chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. He is looking for opportunities to exploit you. He won't be able to do that during the thousand years. All the things I just read, he can't do during the thousand years. Yay. We yeah. respond. Now, for you and I, it won't make any difference because we're going to be in our glorified bodies anyway. He can't mess with us anyway. But those that are on the earth, those that are still in physical bodies, yeah, he can still do that too. Amen? During the millennial kingdom. And he won't be able to do it because he's gone. Right? The next one is he lies to us. I know that's a big surprise. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 12 through 15. Again, that's 2 Corinthians 11, verse 12 through 15. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we in the things, uh, in the things whereof we boast. In other words, Paul, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what he's saying, because otherwise it's a tongue twister. Paul's saying that there's people that are creeping in, claiming their apostles, claiming their prophets, claiming their teachers, and they're boasting of things that they never have experienced. Things that apostles can boast of, things that, um, that prophets can boast of, but these people can't, right? Are you following? Mm -hmm. And he says, For we and for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. He's lying, isn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah. He's deceiving, isn't he? Therefore, is it any great wonder that his ministers all try, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works? Also, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, all the things that the devil will not be able to do during the millennial kingdom. Verse 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all power. The word power there is dunamos. It's not excusia. It's not talking about authority. It's talking about explosive power. The ability to do things. To get things done. Okay? Are you following? Yeah. No. Okay, the difference between two. the two. We're, again, I, I, hold on, I'm sorry, what? 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 9 and 10. Nine and ten. <clears throat> the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. And now he begins to describe what the working of Satan is like. With all power, that means the ability to get things done. You following? Mm -hmm. Signs and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Okay, so he comes with genuine power signs and lying wonders. All of it there to deceive and lie to us. John chapter 8, verse 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. You are of your father the devil. Jesus talking to the Pharisees. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth. Because there is absolutely no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he draws from his own resources... For he is a liar and the father of all lies. He's a liar. He won't be able to do that for a thousand years. Acts 13.10 is the last verse I'm going to use about lying. There was a lot of them. I was actually, um, gave you just a handful. <laughs> and it says, O oh, full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Now there was talking about a person, but he's talking about how he was being influenced by the devil, right? And what does he say? He says, all full of deceit and fraud. That's what he's like. He won't be able to do that during the millennial kingdom. He also hinders the king, the progress of the kingdom. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Satan hinders the progress of the kingdom. Paul writing to this very beloved church 
about whom he had nothing negative to say. Which is why those two letters stand up like beacons in the middle of the New Testament. It's the only church he had nothing bad to say to. The only one. So he says, therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. Well, you know, he didn't seem like he got, he didn't stand in the way as strong when he was going to Rome and he was going to Ephesus, to uh, to the church of Philippians, to, to, um, uh, to um, you know, um, the other churches. I mean, the devil did give him a little bit of a hard time, but he was always able to make it. But time and again, Paul tried to go to Thessalonica, and the enemy successfully kept him back. Why? Well, he, the devil had a stronghold in the other churches. He couldn't afford for him to get over there to Thessalonica. He thwarts the work of the kingdom. He won't be able to do that during the millennial kingdom. Hallelujah. Right? So let's just review these things that Satan cannot do during the millennial kingdom. He cannot steal the word from people's hearts. He will not be able to lead them to destruction. He will not be able to entice them in, to lie against God, themselves, and others. They will, he will not be able to tempt them. He will, not be able to constant, he will not be constantly able to look to take advantage of them. He will not be able to lie to them, and he will not be able to hinder the progress of God's kingdom. None of those things will be able to happen through the enemy during that time period. Yet, with his influence removed, will that keep man from rejecting God? Absolutely not. No, no. Revelation chapter 20, looking at verse 7 through verse 10. It says, now when the, that's again, it's Revelation 20, verse 7 through verse 10. Now when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be, be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the, the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Then fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them all. The devil and who deceived them was cast alive into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet already were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Mm. So people's hearts don't really require the enemy to do all that, do they? No. I mean, now, if their hearts have been fully dedicated to God, they've been walking with Jesus and living inside of that kingdom with him, they will not have been easily moved. Because we're not talking about the kind of God situation you and I have. The scriptures say about our situation, whom you have not seen you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing. That day, they're going to be able to see him and touch him. He will be a very real God in a very real physical body. And people will still not have hearts towards him. So, but you and I have hearts towards him. <laughs> you guys look like you're about to start crying. <laughs> Amen. Right? Whom having not seen, you love. Though now not having seen him, Yet rejoicing, you receive with joy inexpressible and full of glory, Amen. right? Amen. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul, which honors the king. It puts another crown on his head. Amen? The kingdom of Mark has bowed the knee to Christ. Amen? Amen. The kingdom of, Paul, of Pam has bowed the knee to Christ and put the crown on his head. Amen? Amen. King of kings, Lord of lords, see him crowned with many crowns, right? Thank you, Jesus. And he's worthy of every last one and infinite number besides. True? Amen. Go ahead and turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 24. This is the millennial kingdom. Jesus begins to talk about it. Now, it's very important that you understand that the disciples had no idea. They still were clueless, and they were still thinking that the millennial kingdom was something that Jesus was going to set up right then and there. They had no idea of a time period between. Yes. I'm sorry, what was the first Thessalonians 1 through 4? That's okay, it was in um, 2.18. Whatever they yes. just said. First Thessalonians 2.18. Thank you, appreciate that. Thank you. You're All right. Matthew 24, we're going to start reading in verse um, 5, I believe. Did I write that out? No, I didn't, so I have to read it here. Matthew 24. Starting in verse 5, 
I'm going to read to verse 14. It says, actually, we're going to start in verse uh, 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many, many right? Yeah. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Again, the word must is in there, right? Now this happened after, by the way, just give you a context, the disciples had shown Jesus, as though he had never seen it, the temple. And showed him all the various aspects of the temple. And it was a glorious place. And by today's standard, it was eye-popping. I mean, it, this thing, it, people from a distance could see it because it reflected light from the gold on it. It was an amazing, amazing temple, okay? So, um, and you know, so they were very enamored by their, by their temple. And they're showing Jesus all about it, you know, and making sure he knew about it. And his response was, you know what, um, I'm telling you that the day's coming where not one brick will be standing upon another. It'll be totally in ruins. And so later on, the disciples were asking him a question, uh, when is that going to happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? Now, you need to understand from the, 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 um, from the disciples' perspective, the this is where we get messed up with eschatology. And I, and I am no eschatological, es eschatological um, person. I don't even really like eschatology. I never have. Um, which is the study of the end, or the study of the book of Revelation, whatever. But, you know, you have to make sure context, context, context. It's Everything is centered around context. When he's talking to these Jewish men, at this point they still had no concept of a rapture. They had no idea that a rapture was going to take place. They didn't know there was going to be a time of the Gentiles. Right? right. All they saw was that when the Messiah came, he was going to establish a kingdom. So at this point, they're still believing that. They just, and just like you and I, even though Jesus had mentioned a few times, I'm going to die, they just kind of swept that under the proverbial theological rug because they had no bag to put it in. They just kept on knowing, well, I know he's the Messiah, I know he's the Christ, and the Christ is going to set up a kingdom. So maybe the whole dying thing's metaphorical. You know, he talks in parables all the time. You know, all I know is that they knew, they were absolutely certain that this was, when, he, when they're talking about what will be the sign of your coming, they did not mean of the rapture, they meant of the establishment of your kingdom. Are you following me? Yeah. Now, now, New Testament Christians will read that and think, this is talking about signs for the rapture. Are you following? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Consequently, they line up a lot. Because of the fact that before the millennial reign can happen, the rapture has to happen, and the tribulation has to happen. So some of this does, in fact, line up. But it's not what they were asking him. They were not asking him, what will be the sign of the rapture, of your coming again? That's not what they were asking. Are you following me? Okay? So that's, that's pretty important going in. He says, um, and so Jesus is answering the question they asked, not the one that you and I in the New Testament church think. Okay? Okay. That, that needs, I hope that makes sense. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. Okay, so he says, starting in verse 6 again, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in various <coughs> places. All of these are just the beginning of troubles. Just the beginning. You could possibly say that this part right there, it could possibly be, um, you know, um, a, a, it's probably a precursor to, but it might actually be um, uh, during the first three and a half years, probably not because peace is going to be reigning, but peace is not going to be all over the world. Again, you need to remember that, that the Antichrist is not going to have a global thumbprint. It will still be very local. Yeah. So there's still going to be places all over the planet that are not immediately underneath his jurisdiction. You understand that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this could still be during the, the, um, the first three and a half years of um, the tribulation because the peace is not going to necessarily be a global peace. It's just going to be a peace in the Middle East, okay? Which traditionally, if you have peace there, you have peace most other places too. <laughs> Isn't it true? Yeah. You know? So anyway, it says, All these things are, um, uh, are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. 
And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures steadfast to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever has ears, to, uh, I'm sorry, whoever um, reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. And let not him who is in the field not go back up to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant in those days and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may, be, may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world unto this very time. No, not ever after either. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I told you before it happened. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner room, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. That's talk, talking about the second coming. That's talking about the establishment of the millennial reign. Right. When he comes down and you and I come down with him on white horses. Are yeah. oh, you following? Yeah. Do you see how that can get messed up in your head? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay, because he's answering the question they asked. They didn't know to ask about a rapture. Is that with me? Yeah. Okay. He says... The sign, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to read verse 29 again. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, oh, did I, I'm sorry, I didn't even get that far. Verse 27, I'm going to read 27 again. For the, as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For whoever, where the carcass is, uh, carcass is there will the eagles be, eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. So you can tell this is after the tribulation, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? The yes. moon will not give its light. The stars will fall, will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see that the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he, and, we, uh, I'm sorry, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four, four winds, and uh, from every end of heaven to the other. This is the gathering together of the Jews for the millennial kingdom. Are you still following? Yeah. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, okay. Now, uh, I'm going to actually, that's why I'm going to stop, because he goes into a parable. Now, I wrote a few things down about this to kind of uh, um, uh, put it into a synopsis. Um, let's see. So they, their question to Jesus was, "What will be the sign? I'm sorry, what will be the what will, when will the destruction of the temple be, and when will when will be the sign of your return and the end of the age?" These were two. That last one was two questions wrapped up in one because their Jewish minds didn't understand the concept, of course, of the rapture, which I just told you. Um, Christ. Um, let's see. Yeah, I've already told you that. Okay. Go ahead and turn real quickly to Acts chapter 1. I'm going to give you the synopsis in a minute. Because I actually wrote that in a separate place. Acts chapter 1. I want to make sure that you see that this was still their understanding before I give you the synopsis. I know I said it, and I know that you've got logical reason to believe it, but let me just show it to you. Acts chapter 1. Starting in verse 1, reading through verse 9. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after, uh, after he, through the Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
to whom he had presented himself alive after having suffered by many infallible proofs, seeing, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with one accord, um, yeah, I'm sorry, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So when Jesus had come back from the dead, they still believed yeah. that's the next thing that's going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see? It was still in their head, wasn't it? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Right? Yeah. So, so you can see that was already still in their mind. Now go ahead also and let's look at another place in Luke, the first chapter. This was also in Jesus' mother's mind through a prophecy that was given to her at the birth of her son, or actually before the birth of her son, Jesus. Luke chapter 1, just looking at verse 31 and 32. Luke chapter 1, verse 31 and 32. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So what is she thinking is going to happen in Jesus' physical lifetime? You, you follow, right? So this was in their head, wasn't it? Yeah. Right? And so it wasn't without good reason. Would you agree with me? Right. But also, you know, many years later when they got a better understanding of what was actually happening, Jesus has been gone for about 20 years. In the book of Acts, turn to the book of Acts chapter 15, the council in Jerusalem made a statement of the millennial kingdom. So all of these are pointing to, we know for a fact Jesus is going to come down and reign physically. They all knew it, didn't they? Yes. They just had the timing off. Yeah. right? Even though Daniel did talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. In Acts, the 15th chapter, looking in verse 14, reading to verse 17, Simon has, de has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And this and with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as, as it is written. A after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and will set it up again, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all of these things. So God is going to see to it that the ruins are raised back up again. Right? Yeah. Now, now you need to understand, that's probably going to happen at least three times altogether. It happened at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. It's very likely, it, if I understand biblical prophecy properly, it's going to be rebuilt before the, um, the Antichrist comes back. And then it's going to be destroyed again. And then it's going to be rebuilt again during the time of Jesus Christ when he's reigning in the millennial reign. Okay? At that point, of course, it won't have to be destroyed again. All right? Now, I want us to examine what Jesus said. I only read those verses after reading Matthew chapter 24 so that you could see that this was something that was solidly in their mind. Did you understand why I did that? Mm -hmm. So now looking back at Matthew 24, this is the reply that Jesus gave back to them, to their question of when will be, when is going to be the destruction of the temple? Well, you know, that really is a loaded question because which destruction are you talking about? You're talking about the one that's going to happen in about another 50 years, I mean another um, 40 years, you know, from Jesus' perspective? Or are you talking about the destruction of the temple that will happen after the sign of the Antichrist? I'm guessing because he's talking about the Antichrist and the Millennial Kingdom. He's probably talking about the second one, not the one that happened in 70 AD. Are you following me? And I'm guessing. I mean, did you hear me say the word guessing? Right? I don't know. But I'm pretty sure in context, assuming in context is my friend, we're talking about the future destruction after his future rebuild. Okay? Are you following? So, um, Jesus' reply to them was, Let no one lead you astray or deceive you, and thus turn you away to false Christs. 
He also said, don't be troubled. At the beginning, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. At the very beginning, kingdoms and nations will make war with each other. Famines, blights on crops, natural disasters, and so on will happen in various places. At the very beginning, right? Of the time period in question. Are you still with me? Yeah. He also said, as things progress, the world will turn strongly against the church and against Israel. Now, he didn't actually use the word church. He was specifically talking about Israel, but it also includes the church, though they didn't know that. All right? The world will turn strongly against the church and Israel, which, by the way, we're, we're seeing, aren't we? Yes? Persecuting you and killing you. Some of you will be offended against the faith and will betray your brethren. By that, that means fellow Christians against Christians and fellow, fellow Israel countrymen against Israel countrymen. Okay? So Israelites of the nation of Israel will turn against one another and Christians will turn against one another. False prophets will come and successfully deceive many. Lawlessness will be pervasive in the world and because of this people will stop loving each other nearly all together. If you persevere in this environment all the way to the end, you will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations. Then the end will come. For this reason, when you see the abomination that makes desolate in the temple, run, he's telling the Jews. Run! Don't stick around. Don't go back and get something out of your house. Don't go tell anybody. Pray to God that you're not pregnant because you won't be able to run fast. Run. Because bad days are coming. All right? You hear what he's saying? Right? What is the abomination of desolation? Well, Daniel talks about it in the book of Daniel. And that is essentially, now you need to understand, an abomination is something that is an egregious um, rebellion against God. Um, any sin is a rebellion against God. But the word abomination is used very sparingly in Scripture. And it's always associated with something that is like a high-handed sin. It is, um, it's in the face of God. You know, it's very, very in his face and defiant. Okay? The abomination that makes desolate in the holy place. Now we know where it's going to be happening. It's going to, the, des the abomination is going to take, is going to be in the temple. Well, we know in the New Testament it tells us what that abomination is. It's going to be the Antichrist who sets himself up as God in the temple of God, claiming that he's God in God's temple. When that happens, he says to the Jews, run, because bad days are coming. Yes? This is all taking place after the church is gone? This part right here will be part of the tribulation and undoubtedly the first part of it. I don't know whether we are living before the tribulation, in the middle of it, or after it. I'm guessing probably before <coughs> or mid. I, I, I incline towards mid uh, because there's just too many passages to overlook. Um, and I'm not saying that we couldn't be all the way through it because even though the wrath of God is being poured upon the sons of disobedience during that time period, it will not be poured upon his children. Okay, but we would be present. Okay, so but I so I really don't know. I mean, it's a good question, and I wish I knew the answer. And there are a lot of people out there that are a lot smarter than me about all these things, and they disagree. So it's real hard to say. So uh, and I and again, I could probably, if you guys wanted to, at some time, I could point out the various scriptures that show that any one of those could be true. Yeah. Okay, but the, not tonight. But does that make sense? Do you follow yeah. what I'm saying? Uh, unfortunately, I can't give you a solid answer on that. I wish I could. But um, let's see. I want to. Where was I? Um, the abomination of desolation. Um, it says, for this reason, when the abomination that lays or makes desolate is in the temple, run. Things are about to get really bad. It appears that Israel will rebuild the temple. When the Antichrist comes, he will do away with temple sacrifice and will proclaim himself as God in that temple. This will occur at probably the end of the first three and a half years of the tribulation. And it will begin the time of great trouble. Which is why God says, run. During this time, the false Christ will come, performing miracles in order to deceive. And he tells them, don't be deceived. When Christ returns, you will know it. All Jews will be gathered by an angel to Jerusalem, 
and, um, and the millennial reign will begin and you'll see Christ with your own eyes. So don't be deceived when people try to tell you, oh, he's out in the desert, or he's over here, or he's over there. No, no, no. When he shows up, you'll know it. Right? right? That's what he's telling Israel. Okay? Now, you and I, at that point, I know for sure, already will not be here. Because we are the ones coming down with him to establish his millennial reign. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Right? So, uh, when the disciples did not, um, let's see. Yeah, I already, I've already said that to you. Go ahead and turn now, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, and we'll probably wind up, unfortunately, ending there before I can even get to some of the good stuff. But that's okay. Um, so it's all good, but, you know, it's just... I know there's a lot of reading, but, you know, uh, it's important that we actually see it in Scripture. Would you agree with me on that? Uh, I think that it's important that you see it in Scripture and that you know where it's, I, I got it and all of that. But all of this, I want you to see that every, can you see that every single thing, that every page we turn and everything we read, God is establishing his kingdom. Yes. Can you see that? Is that becoming more and more abundantly clear to you? I hope yes. that it is. Yes. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's talking about the rapture. Are you with me? Yeah. Whether this is mid-trib or pre-trib, I don't know. Again, I, I don't really believe we're going to be here through the last part of the tribulation, though I believe it is possible. But it would have to be, it would really, really have to happen pretty quickly, the rapture. Because, I mean, on the heels, I mean, right on the heels of the last of the, last of the seven years is when we've already had a wedding feast and we're already coming down dressed in white. Right. There's a big procession that takes place. Now, I also understand that when you get outside of this natural earthly environment, there is no time. Yeah. And you could do a thousand years of activity in a second okay. uh, relative to earth time. So is it possible? Sure, it's possible. I'm just saying that it's, it's unlikely. That's all I'm saying about that. Okay. So, But this is the time period that the church is raptured. It says, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our, this is a church he's writing to, right? Mm -hmm. Our gathering together to him, we ask you. Do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if it were from us, as though the day of the Lord had already come. Some people were coming in there to the Thessalonican church and trying to tell them, Oh, you missed it. Yeah. Jesus already returned. Sorry, gigs up. And they were being, they're like, wait, that can't happen. I belong to him. <laughs> so Paul's writing and saying, hey, I'm, I'm asking you, don't be troubled. You know, I mean, notice that, you know, the enemy is trying to deceive Israel about when Jesus is coming back for them. And he's trying to deceive the church about when he's coming back for them. He's just deceiving. It's what he does. Yeah. Right? So he says, don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if it came from us as though the Lord of the day of Christ had already come. Let no one deceive you by, by any means, for that day will not come unless the great falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, which is one of the reasons why I believe we'll be here for the first part of the millennial reign, I mean, that for the first part of the uh, tribulation, because he's not revealed in the temple until about halfway through the first part of the, of the tribulation. Right. And it says that the rapture is not taking place until the man of wickedness has been revealed. And, and, and it makes it sound, and we're going to see here in a second, um, I think it's in this place. I'll just keep on reading, and then I'll say it if, if it does. Let, us, let no one deceive you as, uh, by any means, as though that day, for that day cannot come unless the great falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who's, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits, there it is, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That, is, that, that happens right there. That last part happens mid-trib. So chances are we'll be here. That's all I'm saying about that. Is it possible that maybe he does this at the beginning of the tribulation and he stays in the temple for three and a half years? Possible, but when you read things that are associated with the actual abomination that lays desolate in the temple, it makes it sound like, bam, as soon as that happens, bad days are coming. Right? Because that's when he said, run. To the, to the Israelites, right? Yes, ma'am. Well, he also says, uh, you're talking about, except there come a falling away. A great falling away. If the church is away. gone, mm -hmm. there'd be no, there'd be no, no falling away. to fall away from. Exactly. That's so. right. Absolutely. 
So he says, um, and again, this is saying that the rapture of the church isn't going to happen until after these events, right? He says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So the temple is going to have to be rebuilt, isn't it? Yes. Right? Okay? Um, and, and by the way, when, when the, 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 the um, Antichrist does do this in the temple, he's going to stop sacrifice. He can't do that unless Israel reinstitutes it. Right. You realize that in Israel right now, they are breeding red heifers right. for the very purpose of offering sacrifices when a temple is finally complete. Yeah. Yeah. We're narrowing down on the days, guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This has never happened before. I mean, they've talked about it for a long time, but they're actually doing stuff about it now. Yeah. Okay, so, are you, are you getting this? Yeah. You know, this is reason to start smiling. Yeah. You know, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, the bride and the spirit say, "Come, yeah. right? Amen? Amen. We're getting close, right. and we have the opportunity right now to honor God in our dispensation of the kingdom, yeah. glorify Him in all that we are. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Don't let the day pass you by. Amen. Yeah. Jesus, don't let that happen." Now, um, let's see, um, verse 5. Do, not, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you all these things? And now you know um, what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Talking about the Antichrist might be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work in the world. 2,000 years ago it was already at work, right? Yeah, yeah. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, I don't have any idea what that's talking about. I, I have good idea, but I really don't know, and I don't. So I don't want to be dogmatic. Are you following me? Yeah. So uh, it's my contention that he's talking about because the word "taken away" is is a, again like so many Greek words, it's a special word, and in context, it doesn't mean utterly removed. It just means um, it almost implies a different dispensation. Yeah. So if I'm reading it right, which I don't know, but if I'm reading it right. What's holding off the actual establishment of, uh, of, the, the, um, of the abomination that lays desolate in the temple and the great unveiling of the, of the uh, Antichrist is the presence of the, the time of the Gentiles, the church. Mm -hmm. And that when the Holy Spirit is the one that is holding back. Mm -hmm. And when the church leaves and the dispensation in which the Holy Spirit is working with the children of men as he is right now is gone then the influence of the enemy will be increased. Yeah. Now, the Holy Spirit will not leave the earth. People will still be getting born again. But it's going to be a different dispensation, and it won't be like it was during the last 2,000 years. It'll be a lot more like it was before the age of the church. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The Holy Spirit was here during the time of when the law was here, right? Yeah. But people were not just flocking to get, you know, coming to the, um, uh, the <laughs> nation of Israel, right? Even the nation of Israel really wasn't wanting to necessarily be in the nation of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yet when the Holy Spirit came, 3,000 were added in a day. People began to flock in, right? They were hungry for God. He created that, and I'm thinking that during the, when this time period ends, the Holy Spirit will still be here, but the type of work he'd been doing for the last 2,000 years will come to an end, okay? And wickedness will begin to increase. Mm -hmm. Lawlessness will abound, yes. The Holy Spirit inhabits the people. Yes, he does, the but he church. also moves over the earth. Yes. And the church, okay, and the church is gone, then he will... He'll still be here, though. Cover the earth. Okay. He'll still cover the earth, yeah. But yeah, he is, he's in and among his people, but yes, it was the Holy Spirit, of course, that, that, that gave, gave us the inward revelation that Jesus Christ and God is born again, right? Yeah. So, um, so he's working with the world, and we're, we're grateful for that because we're part of it, right? So it says, um, now in verse, uh, let's see, uh, restraining, verse 7, um, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth. Now, they're skipping some stuff going here, which happens like a lot in prophecy, didn't I tell you that? Yeah. Because God is going to consume him with the breath of his mouth, but he's still about three and a half years here. Once he's revealed, he's got three and a half years of utter destruction that's going on on this planet. Are you right? You get me? Yes? Yeah. But it sounds like he's going right from one thing to the next. Are you seeing? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure, because I it, it can get confusing. It says, and then the lawlessness, oh, the lawless one will be revealed, 
whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's when he and you and I come back together to establish his kingdom. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, the ability to do things, right? Signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason... God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That's back in Romans 1 again, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff happens today, doesn't it? Because they didn't retain God in their thinking, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things that are unwholesome, right? Yeah. See that Romans chapter 1? That's happening during today's world. But it's going to happen in mass on this planet at that time. And it will not be a, it will not be a pretty sight. Yeah. says, so uh, um, to believe the lie that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure and unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, because, uh, beloved, I'm sorry, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, who can tell me, what is glory again? Character. Character change, right? To take on his likeness, our hope, which is the glory of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. What does he say here? Read verse 4 again. To which he called, us, called you by our gospel to obtain, uh, for the obtaining of the glory of, um, of our, Lord and Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions that you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen. That was an encouragement before the rapture, right? Yes. That, that's, that, so that hits you and I too, doesn't it? Yes. Now on Sunday, because we have to stop now, um, we're going to go further, and um, I've got like two, three other scriptures I need, I wanted to read. Uh, actually, two scriptures, and I was going to uh, actually uh, give you a little bit more information about what I just read, but I'll do that on Sunday. And then we'll start talking about the time when Jesus is ruling and reigning in the Millennial Kingdom. And the promises are associated with that and what it's going to look like, okay? So are you just, again, are you guys learning some stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you edified? Yes. I mean, because I don't know about you again, but I'm very, very, I'm all the more excited when I realize, uh, and I, it's not that I didn't realize it, but becoming more and more aware of the fact that we really are in the kingdom and that we're in, in a very special dispensation of it that will never be like this ever again. You know, and, and, and every, each one is unique, and God's doing something very special. There's something in particular, I believe, and I'm going to have to spend some time in study about that, but I think if I understand what I've read in the book of Revelation, that there's a very, very special place in God's heart for the time of the Gentiles and the people who have come to Christ during this dispensation. And it looks as though something very special is given to them that isn't given to all the other people who come to the Lord um, in any other dispensation. Um, so I will, we'll pay attention to that whenever we get around to it. So. <laughs>